Okay, so uh, introduce, if you don't know who I am, my name is Dan Walsh. I uh, lead the uh, container, um, uh, basically chief architect of containers at Red Hat. Uh, pretty much everything that happens underneath Kubernetes. Um, so uh, from Kubernetes down, I don't do anything up at the Kubernetes level. Uh, but the main one of the main tools that we've been working on over the last uh, few years is a tool called Podman. If you don't know what that is, uh, Podman is basically a, a tool for running containers locally. Um, and uh, the Podman project is incredibly popular. Uh, so to give you an idea of uh, statistics, Podman right now has uh, about 75,000 stars. There's over 800 forks of it. Um, and um, if you see on... Uh, you know, it's a, it's a fairly active uh, project, uh, lots and lots of community contributors. Um, to give you a, a few more stats, Podman is often, often compared to Docker, um, and this is basically what happened in 2020. Um, Podman had, uh, has had about 139 different authors, um, a few thousand commits. Uh, we've had uh, basically about twice as many uh, uh, issues um, worked on than Docker, and we've had uh, five, uh, four times as many uh, merges have gone into it. Um, also, when you look at these stats, uh, comparing the different projects, Podman is built up of a whole bunch of other projects. So there's also uh, uh, container storage, containers image, containers common, um, but we didn't gather all of those statistics. But you can see it's very, very, very active. Uh, the Podman mailing list has about 150 members right now. Uh, it's a fairly low volume uh, list, so I advise you guys to get onto that. If you go to podman.io, you can follow the instructions to get on it. Uh, it's mainly announcements, but there, there is some discussion um, uh, from people asking, you know, how to how do I do this? How do I fix that? Uh, most of the discussions on Podman also go on IRC um, at Pound Podman on Freenode. Um, there is uh, a lot of and a lot of communications go through GitHub, so GitHub issues. Um, um, is a lot of uh, stuff. So, but most of you guys are here to talk about the new features um, in Podman. And what I, what I looked at when I was starting to throw this together was I went to GitHub and I looked where we were at DevConf last year and um, basically went through all of the um, pages and pages of fixes and stuff that uh, have happened in the different releases. I think there's been about 10 different releases um, since last year. Last year, we were about one point, uh, Podman 1.8. Um, as of this week, we released Podman 3.0. And one of the biggest features of Podman uh, um, 3.0 was to introduce uh, a REST API. Um, so traditionally, uh, Podman um, a year ago was using a tool called Violink for uh, communications between um, to, to allow sort of remote applications to uh, launch Podman containers. Um, and in, you know, Podman advertises itself as being a serverless environment. And what we, what we use is a system D uh, socket activation for uh, launching containers. So uh, Podman will listen, uh, Podman uh, will use a system D to listen on a socket and then uh, individual containers, you can communicate with that socket to launch uh, containers. Uh, so, uh, what with the REST API, we decided to do two different uh, REST APIs, uh, two different endpoints, and we have basically a compatibility mode, or you might think of that as the Docker mode, and then we have LibPod mode. So that really, the LibPod mode is more about the advanced features, things that you know, uh, we you know, things like pods and and different features of of. Uh, um, of, of Podman that aren't available uh, uh, using the traditional mode. Uh, we also are wrapping those. So we have for the REST API, there is a project called Podman PY that's uh, being uh, worked on in the upstream. Um, and it's it's actually somewhat in the fledgling mode. Um, so Podman PY, we really need contributors. We'd uh, really love to have people come in and help help build out the API uh, to, to basically wrap the REST API inside of uh, Python. Uh, with our compatibility layer now, we have full support for a Docker PY. Um, and you know, the goal here was to get, uh, you know, our goal is to allow people to replace uh, Docker with uh, Podman. And 
a lot of people have built applications, CICD systems, um, different uh, uh, tooling to talk to the Docker socket. And a lot of that, it was based on Docker Python bindings, Docker PY. Um, so we actually, um, you know, wanted to test against Docker PY a lot to make sure that we're uh, um, doing everything. Uh, if, and we actually have Docker PY testing running in our upstream CI to make sure that we don't break anything. There are a couple of features in the REST API that we don't currently support and don't plan to ever support. Um, and the two main ones are Link, which has been, uh, Link has actually been deprecated by Docker. Um, so we don't plan on ever supporting it. And then uh, Docker Swarm, we don't support at all. Um, and any of our tools, and and reason for that is we believe that Kubernetes is the future and we really want to guide to people towards Kubernetes. So at this point, I'm going to do a, a live demo. And I figured the best way to do a live demo of the API is to use um, to use Docker client. So if I'm going to use the Docker client, Docker CI, and I'm going to show you that system status of Docker. You see here the Docker is not the Docker daemon is not running. And what have we done is we set up a link between uh, via run. Docker socket. So basically, system uh, Podman is going to be listening at the uh, um, Podman is going to be listening at the uh, API endpoint. So if I'm going to do a Docker endpoint right now, if I do Docker version, you'll see that I'm running the Docker client here. But on the server side, you'll see that it's using Podman to answer the communications with it. And if I did Podman. PS-A, you see Podman containers. If I use Docker PS-A, you see it's using that. Similar, I can do Docker images. Um, I can do Docker inspect. Of an image. And as I said, if you looked at the system right now, You'll see no Docker running on it. So basically what's happening here is the Docker client is implement is talking Docker API fully to a Podman backend. Um, and obviously you could do this with Podman, um, uh, you know, with the Docker PY um, and all, you know, and all other types of communications back and forth between, um, you know, other tool, other tooling uh, that you might have an existing system. And we're having lots and lots of people in the community are, are running uh, tests. I think GitLab is now, you, know, you can do GitLab runners, which are based on talking to the Docker socket. We've had people um, running all sorts of containers that talk to the Docker socket and just leak in the Podman socket. Um, and, and really the goal is to, to be as compatible as, as possible. If something breaks, then, then we consider that a bug. Um, in, in Podman, and we will investigate and fix it. So that is the a quick overview of the REST API, but one of the goals of the REST API was actually to get us to support, get us to the point where we could support Docker Compose. So Docker Compose is an incredibly popular project um, out there, and uh, a lot of people, you know, sort of live and die with Docker Compose. Um, and, and we look at Docker Compose as a good way of running multiple containers on a single platform, although we still would encourage people to use um, Kubernetes for doing that uh, or to use you know, you know, Podman has full support for a thing called Podman Play Kube, which will take a Kubernetes YAML file and launch multiple containers and multiple pods off of it. But because of the installed base of Compose, we wanted to, you know, we obviously wanted to be able to support those use cases as well. Now, a couple of things about the Compose demo we're about to do. Uh, first of all, it's is rootful only at this point. Um, we plan on changing that going forward, but as of 3.0, we only support rootful. And the, the main reason for that is that there's major networking differences, network stack differences between uh, the way the Docker uh, daemon works and the way uh, Podman works. Podman uses a thing called CNI which is based on um, the same tooling that Kubernetes uses for setting up networks. And, and Docker has more of a built-in um, uh, environment. And when you go to rootless containers, the uh, 
uh, we have to use a totally different stack because a lot of a lot of um, stuff that you want to do for setting up networks and IP tables rules things like that are not available to rootless users um, so we have to continue to work through um, the way that Compose could work in a rootless environment. Um, but uh, Compose is also tested. You know, we have lots of tests. Uh, actually, we use the uh, upstream um, Docker uh, Compose uh, repo, and we run all of those uh, Compose uh, repos against on every pull request to make sure that uh, we continue to support um, uh, Compose correctly. Supposed to have a demo slide here, so I'll go back to demoing. Okay, this one is I'm showing I'm gutless, so I'm going to do a asking. I'm actually going to do a. Uh, oops. Then there was a request in the chat to uh, go a little bit slower in the terminal because there's some delay in the stream. Oh, okay. Well, this one's going to be automated, so <laughs> I won't be able to slow uh, control the speed. Uh, Okay, what's, so what's happening here is we're actually um, about to start up the uh, Podman socket. So this is the REST API um, uh, that just gets started. As I said, it's a socket, so it's a, a socket activated um, system. And we're gonna show that it's running on the system. And that shows you the symbolic link on var run Docker socket to be var uh, live Podman socket showing you the version of Docker Compose that we're running. And then these these are actually from the upstream project uh, uh, that underneath the Docker um, repo. And we're about to run the uh, this application. So we're doing a Docker Compose up. We're just gonna launch uh, uh, containers. One of the thing, interesting things about Compose is that Compose actually can do builds at the same time. So what you're seeing right now is uh, uh, Compose is actually building the image and it's using Podman build, which indirectly uses um, Builder to uh, actually build the image um, on the system. And uh, so that's what the, uh, the delay is right now. So we're completing, you can see that it's, it's finishing out writing the image to the system. And these are all different uh, output that you get from Compose. And at this point, Compose tells you that it completed and it's launched multiple containers. So now we're gonna use the Podman command to show you the, the two different containers that are running on the system that were launched by Compose. And in, you can see that uh, traffic brings up a uh, additional network here, and we're listing out the networks that are available to that have been created by the Compose client. And at this point, we're going to attempt to connect to the uh, traffic to show that the application is actually running. And it says hello from Docker, and of course, that's Podman lying. It's actually it should be hello from Pod uh, Podman because there is no Docker running on the system. This point, we're doing shutting down the Docker Compose on the system. See the containers are gone, and now that network uh, interface has also been disappeared from the system. And that is the end of the dem demonstration. Oops. So that is Compose running, uh, and again, any any bugs that you find in Compose. Um, or, or that relates to the API, we plan on fixing. Um, the only, again, as we talked earlier, a lot of Compose has been tied into Swarm. Since we don't support Swarm, we won't be supporting um, uh, those those type of Compose scripts. But for the most part, if you don't, if, if your Compose script doesn't use uh, linking or Swarm, then it should work with the uh, Podman backend. Uh, one last, uh, well, is we talked about uh, the Python bindings to the REST API. We, um, we have two, obviously we have the Docker for the compatibility layer and we have Podman PY for the uh, LibPod uh, layer. Uh, we also have Go bindings for testing to work with our um, 
uh, remote API. And these are based on the same tooling that Podman Remote. So we can use Podman uh, on a Mac or a Windows box to talk the, the RESTful API. And we're making those APIs we're standardized on those Go bindings uh, for that. So the people who want to build their own tooling to talk to the RESTful API can use the Go bindings. Um, there also is effort uh, from community members to work on a Java um, a, a API. Um, we have a lot of discussions going on about a C, C API, and um, I think that there's, you know, there's been talk a little bit about JavaScript and, and some other tooling um, and people using it to, to implement APIs. We also have a thing called Swagger that allows you to build uh, APIs on the fly for different languages. Um, not something I'm an expert at, but uh, so the Swagger is available if you want to talk, if uh, build your own APIs um, or build your own wrappers around the APIs. At this point, I'm going to hand it over to Valentin to take care of this section. Thanks, Dan. So uh, for those who don't know me, I'm Valentin. I'm one of Dan's plumbers, to say so, working uh, with Dan and the team in the community on the container tools and a couple of libraries. Uh, as I wrote a couple of features uh, that Dan wanted to talk about, he asked me to join his talk. So I'm happy to do it. And one thing that I've been working on extensively in the past is the integration with systemd. So one thing that is very close to our hearts is to integrate Portman as seamlessly as possible into a modern Linux desktop. And part of that is systemd. Um, Dan and the team, uh, actually before I joined the team, were working hard on getting this integration also partly uh, into Docker, but it was very hard technically because it's running as a daemon. Um, so it's really hard to integrate that into systemd, which really wants to manage all these resources, wants to know which processes are running. So if you have a client server implementation, this is kind of, kind of hard. Um, also, uh, the maintainers weren't very interested in it, which is bad because when, you know, um, when you want to install packages, many web servers, they really want to install their systemd services. So if you do a DNF uh, install um, HTTPD, for instance, in most cases, you'll need some systemd somewhere. And this is or was bad because really containers were supposed to help us get things done faster. While at the beginning, from a packaging perspective, we were thrown back by a couple of years because many things just didn't work anymore. Um, so Potman approaches systemd uh, a little bit differently, um, not only because we really want to have a tight integration, but also because it's much easier for us because Potman implements a rather traditional fork exec model where containers are really children of the Potman process. So this integrates just very nicely into systemd, which wants to know, you know, which processes are running in a service, which uh, C groups and scopes belong to the service um, to have a proper service and resource management and also lifecycle management. But um, integrating Potman uh, into or running Potman in such a systemd service is um, kind of tricky. There's a couple of things that really need to work that we need to tell systemd. And so we came up with best practices. And similar to allowing for Potman to generate cube files, Potman can also generate systemd unit files. So if you do a Potman generate systemd uh, on a container or a pod, Potman will spit out these dot service files and you can easily deploy them rootless and also as root. Um, on the contrary, what I was also talking uh, a little bit before is Potman also runs seamlessly inside a container. So if you start, if the entry point of a container is systemd or init, Potman will set up all the different mount points, uh, tempfs's that systemd wants to run inside the container and this will run just fine. Um, you can also control it on the CLI. So if you do a potman run or potman create dash dash systemd equals true. So when you set the flag to true, it will run as well. And with this integration into systemd, um, this allowed for us to cover uh, new use cases. And uh, a really cool one that we worked on last year is potman auto update. 
So what Podman auto update does is it checks the containers which are running in a system D service at the moment and reaches out to the registries that the containers use, you know, the images that the containers are using and checks if there's a new one. If there's a new one, it will automatically pull down the new image, restart the services, and uh, voila, this is an auto update. So it, this, is, this is really nice to automate certain use cases and target use case, um, or what we had in mind is edge. So while there are different um, definitions of what edge is, I guess most people can, uh, or would agree on it's running outside of our data centers and it's pretty cool to see now where this is being used just uh, two weeks ago uh, i was talking with uh, another colleague uh, who told me well this is now being used on oil rigs so this is really the far edge you're somewhere on the <laughs> on the ocean the connectivity can be bad or not there at all but by using system D and by somehow not re-implementing the, the wheel at that point, this is really powerful and super, super stable. So to illustrate this a little bit, thanks Dan, uh, we prepared a demo uh, to show you know, how you can use Podman auto update. I was talking a little bit um, already about the, the points that the intro now, now uh, is talking about, you know, we really want to have this tight integration. And if you want to trigger up uh, these auto updates, you can use the Podman auto dish update command, or, you know, you can also customize everything uh, via systemd timer unit pair that we use. So this allows for covering event-based uh, triggers if you want to, you know, shell out to Podman or use via systemd dependencies the um, systemd, the Podman dash auto update uh, unit, or if you have a more time based approach, you know, you can use a cron, cron like um, systemd timer. So, what we do now is we first set up a local registry, then we copy one image to it. So, we want to simulate, um, you know, an update and we create a container based on it. So now we first run a local registry. We copy just a very small uh, image for the demo. So an older Alpine 3.1. Now we create a container with this image. And now it's important notice that there is the dash dash label IO containers auto update image. So if you, you got to configure it in uh, for auto updates. So this is something you got to opt in. So now we can generate a systemd unit for this specific container and start the systemd unit. So what we do, uh, all right, there was a little lag at least on my end. So we first did a Podman generate systemd. We copied the file into Dan's home directory. Um, everything works rootless, by the way. So here we reload the systemd daemon. We start the container uh, service. And now we have a look at the service and uh, let's try to re remember the main pit that we're seeing there. So here, all right. So here we see that the service is running the main pit. This is Conmon. Conmon is the container monitor. So it's, it's a really small, small shim around the container written in C um, that Potman and its sibling projects uses to run and monitor containers, which keeps namespaces open, um, does logging, um, and also collects the exit status, among other things. So now if we run Potman auto update, well, nothing, nothing should really happen because we, oh, something was still happening. I guess we should have um, changed the, um, we ran the demo before, so this was, uh, I guess a, a bug in this uh, in the script. We should have cleaned it cleaned it up properly before. Uh, so when you run it on a fresh system, uh, nothing nothing would happen here because we didn't update uh, the image yet. So if we now update the image, so we would override it and then rerun Podman auto update. <laughs> Let's see if it's starting now. If the image was already overwritten before, yes, this is the expected outcome. So Potman auto update, we can see that the image has been pulled down. It will also um, write which um, 
system D service has been restarted and we can see here um, the main PID has changed because we restarted the service. So what Podman auto update does, it goes through the containers, it looks at the environment of these containers and the environment of the container in the Podman database knows which system D service it is running in. And then Potman will reach out via Dbus to System D and ask System D to restart the service. So uh, I, I think implementing auto update wasn't more than 80 lines of code. Um, otherwise, it would have. So if we wouldn't have this tight integration with System D, we would have to re-implement a lot of logic. And I think this is a nice uh, a nice example of how far we can we can push certain use cases by you know just using what's there on a modern Linux desktop already. All right, um, another thing um, we've been working on uh, and which now made it into Potman 3.0 is in, we improved short name resolution. So when a, a short name is an, a reference on an image that does not point to a registry. So when you do a Docker pull Fedora, Docker will always resolve to the Docker hub. So instead of pulling just Fedora, it will resolve to docker.io slash library slash Fedora. They're colon latest. So there are certain rules to resolve and normalize these short names. And um, th this work, worked well for a certain amount of time, but after, after a couple of years, more and more uh, you know, requirements came, came up. We want to run uh, or also resolve to the Fedora registry, the Santos registry, uh, Red Hat, there's Quay, there, you know, all, all major companies and distributions have their own registry. So uh, Potman and sibling tools allowed for uh, using or resolving to more than that. So you can configure everything in Etsy containers registries conf. If you're interested into that, I will give a presentation about that later uh, this afternoon or morning or evening, depending where you are. So, just in a couple of hours. So um, to improve uh, a little bit uh, on that and also to improve uh, the, the, the security of pulling, uh, pulling images, we wanted to make this more explicit. So when you update now to Potman 3.0, you will notice that when you're running Potman in a terminal where you have access to a TDY, Potman will prompt you and ask you which image you really want to pull from so that there's no um, unexpected surprise. So here, just an example, if you do a Potman pull image column tag, it will ask you which registry you really want to pull down this image. If you selected one image and the pull has been successful, Potman will record an alias for it. So image will then be aliased with the selection that we chose before. So Dan, if you can jump to the next slide, a new feature in this case is also short name aliasing, um, which is now uh, an additional uh, additional field in the registries.conf, um, which allows uh, us to configure it by default. So here there's just a, a snippet of the short names that are now being shipped in Fedora, soon in CentOS, and also in, in RHEL. So there you're not prompted uh, anymore. Um, and below you can see the link to an upstream project on github.com containers short names. So this is something that is a community wide approach where we we're, we're pretty happy that it was so well received by the community um, and also by other companies. So then they can really make official where they want their images to live to live on. So people are not locked in into uh, one registry, in this case, Docker Hub, but they can really choose where where they want um, their image to be pulled from. So, you know, we have uh, Red Hat for sure. We have SUSE, um, Oracle, a couple of other uh, Linux distributions, Microsoft. And um, if you're interested into it, I will also talk about this later on this this afternoon. I would just like to uh, remind the time. So we have like five more minutes for the talk or something. <laughs> uh, we will have time for the questions, uh, but feel free to continue now. I'll hand it over. Okay, so we have uh, 30 minutes left of presentation and we have five minutes left. So I'll try to rush, rush through some of this stuff. Uh, basically, uh, we've had lots of fe uh, features for security. Um, 
one of the things that Docker standardized on many years ago was the default list of capabilities, Linux capabilities. Um, I've argued that a bunch of these are uh, we really don't want by, on by default. So with 3.0, we're actually moving to um, drop some of these capabilities. Uh, the three that uh, I'm listing here are three that I don't believe should be on in generalized containers. Um, you can modify this. We have a new feature that we won't have time to talk about called containers.conf. And you can actually specify yourself what the default list of capabilities if you want to go back to what Docker originally specified, but we've dropped those three capabilities. Uh, we also have a new feature um, in Podman. Uh, this actually helps people not uh, run privileged containers. So there's certain use cases. Uh, one of the things that um, contain we do with containers is part of the proc file system is is sort of masked over where we um, hide certain features of the uh, just to protect to be, run the system more securely, um, and we mask over these file systems with empty directories that you know just to prevent use you know bad applications from interacting with them while we mount um, certain directories read only um, to prevent attacks. But the problem with that is certain applications, you know, you might have an application that can run really well in a lockdown container, um, but just needs to be able to use one of these uh, kernel file systems. And so in that case, the only option for users of these applications is to run the thing totally privileged. Um, so what we did is we exposed the ability to uh, unmask um, uh, paths. So if you you find out that this one path you need to be able to run, then uh, people building that image can say, well, just run with this option and we'll allow you to just that path. Similarly, we have added masks. So if there's parts of the operating system that you want to hide, or if there's part, uh, parts of proc that you want to hide from users, you can actually mask, add additional masks um, over uh, directories. Um, also, the proc file system is, has lots of different options for um, being mounted, and you can go into man or proc FS and, and find those. And again, certain, certain types of containers need advanced options of proc uh, to be mounted in different ways. And so we've exposed some of that. Uh, the last thing from a security point of view, I've been talking about user namespace for many years and running Podman in rootless mode it takes advantage of user namespace. Uh, but I'd really like to get pe more people to use it in, in rootful containers, as like some of the stuff that uh, uh, Valentin was talking about, system D uh, generated containers. Uh, and with uh, the, the difficulty with using any space is you really want to pick unique groups of, of UIDs for running your containers that are different than all other containers. And so we built into Podman the ability to auto-generate, auto-pick uh, groups of UIDs for running individual containers. So with a flag like this, you, every container you generate will run inside of a different user namespace. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about quickly as we run out of time, and um, sadly I won't be able to show the demo for this, um, is uh, we wanted to make Podman and Builder uh, better at building multi-architecture images. And so now we have um, Podman build dash dash manifest. Uh, so when you're building a multi-arch image, you, you create a, what's called a manifest list. And a manifest list is basically a way of, it's, it's a manifest that lists out multiple different images to build up that. So when uh, the goal is, is if you go to a registry and you pull down something like UBI-8 and you happen to be on an S390 machine, you don't want to have to specify that you're an S390 machine. And you know, what you want is the tooling, your, your, um, you know, Docker or Podman or Cryo or any of these tools to be smart enough to pull down the specific image for your architecture. Uh, well, those images are somewhat difficult to build. And so now what we've done is extended build, Podman and Builder to be able to build those images on the fly. So if you, uh, and, and one of the cool things that's in Linux is the ability of, uh, to build these uh, images in emulation mode. So with, um, uh, Podman 3.0, you can actually build on a x86 machine, you could build an S390 version of your image, a x86 M version of your image, and your ARM version of the image. And then you could just use a single command, Podman push, then to push the image to, to the registry. And, and now, you know, people on different platforms and different architectures can use your images. But as I said, we're running way out of time here. Uh, is other features, one of the big features we added in a lot of this was, was to handle multiple different networking. So uh, Podman uh, now has uh, really extensive networking access. So there's a Podman network command. 
based on the Docker network command. Uh, we can actually add containers and move containers between different types of networks. We can uh, connect containers to different networks. You can also set up network aliases. So if you want to call a container, um, you, you can basically alias a container as being database, and then you could you know, run other containers on your system, and then if they connect to you know, database colon, um, they'd be able to interact directly with the database application and figure out which one of the containers was running it. And that's all been wired into the system. So there's really some nice advanced features of, of networking between containers and, and um, a lot of functionality has gone into fixing that over the last year. Um, lastly, I'm going to run through some new commands that didn't exist a year ago. So there's now podmin volumes. Um, so there's, there's a bunch of commands for creating um, named volumes on your system. So you can create them, inspect them, uh, list them, prune them. Uh, also, these support uh, Docker and defined a protocol for um, um, basically Docker volume plugins. And so now with Podman can support those. So if you have um, certain volume plugins that you want to use on your system that were built for Docker, uh, Podman can now take advantage of those as well. It will talk to protocol to, to those volumes. Um, one of the features that we've been asked for for a really long time was to be able to rename containers. And actually this was core, uh, turns out Compose does a lot of renaming. Um, so we finally have added the Podman container rename functions to the system. Um, uh, la another feature, really kind of cool feature now is we allow you to mount images. So Podman, uh, I think a year ago was allowed you to mount container images. Um, and you know, so you could actually just mount an image. You'll get, it'll give you back a mount point, and you can go into that uh, image and look around inside of the uh, for content on on your system. So it's sort of uh, being able to review it. Um, so that was for containers. Now we have it for images as well. So we can interact either with container. And when, when I'm talking about a container, a container is a non-committed image. Um, so you could look at a running containers, what's going on in its content, but you can also look at individual images. And that's totally uh, also works inside of the Podman command where you can run a container on, you can run a container in the bottom example here where I'm basically running a UBI8 container, but I can actually mount an image from my image store into the container. So in this command, the bottom config, command down here is actually showing you mounting the Fedora image into at slash Fedora image inside of your UBI 8 container. And imagine if you're doing a scan, you could have a, a tool that scans containers or just does some kind of examination of, of images and you could run containers on that. So it's, a, it's an interesting use case um, for uh, uh, using uh, uh, Podman, uh, some advanced features. So I'm gonna stop sharing now. And I think we might have three minutes left to, um, yes. to so uh, answer any questions. You have seven more minutes if it's needed. Uh, and I see oh, that I... Valentin already responded to some of the questions. So I will leave it up to you. Uh, just please start with the, with the question at the bottom. I can, I can handle it. Uh, so I'll jump to yeah. the ones that I didn't uh, answer yet. Um, da -da -da, or they didn't reply. Thanks, some others. Uh, helped reply as well. So here there's one from Nick Piper. What do you recommend with Podman to ensure one container instance is running on any of one of three rel hosts and for directing user traffic to that one floating container instance? Okay, so you, you, you to me, you're asking a question that I would say we Podman is not the use case for that. So if you want to run containers on multiple different hosts and you want to make sure that there's one instance of your application running on different hosts, uh, you're entering in the world of Kubernetes. That's orchestration at that point. So Podman is all about managing containers on a single host. Um, as soon as you go off host, you know, I think you, you're looking at a higher level tool that's sort of going to coordinate those and uh, the, to the tool for that to me is Kubernetes or something, you know, if you want to get a productized version of Kubernetes, then you go with something like OpenShift. Um, you know, Podman has no, I, you know, Podman has the ability to communicate with other Podmans through Podman Remote, um, but you'd have to build higher level tools on top of it to do that, so. 
Another interesting one. I already replied to it, but maybe, maybe you can iterate a little bit. Um, Dan, I believe you stated Potman uh, allows to run multi multiple images without using Compose as well, using Kubernetes YAML files. And the question is yeah. whether Potman Play Cube requires, uh, you know, Kubernetes micro uh, KS or K3S for it. No. So what, what's happening uh, with Podman Play Cube is we're just taking the Kubernetes YAML and we're converting it into you know, our API calls. So Podman Play Cube and Podman Generate Cube is is just generating YAML files. You're basically using the Kubernetes YAML files and input to us to build containers. We have no integration. Podman has no formal integration into Kubernetes, does not require Kubernetes. Uh, but our, our real goal with Kubernetes, and um, uh, we have a we have a conference coming up in a couple of weeks, and we're going to have a, a, a nice demonstration. So there's the Podman, I mean, the container demos days, which is, I think, March 8th and March 9th is coming up. Um, and we're going to show a demonstration of someone going from Compose, you know, taking a Compose script, running containers, and then using Podman to examine those containers and actually generate Kubernetes, and then allowing you to take those Kubernetes generated and running inside of something like OpenShift um, on it. Uh, but really what we we view Kubernetes, or we re view Podman as the tool for running locally containers, but then allowing people to easily get into Kubernetes. And so we really want to make sure that Podman allows you to take sort of the traditional way you ran containers, like with Docker or something like that, and and be able to easily get to Kubernetes, which I find you know it's it's difficult to get um, into Kubernetes, but you know with that tooling. So that's the idea. But yeah, there's no, we don't require any other services to be running to be able to run Podman containers with or without Kubernetes YAMLs. So to not only focus on the positive ones and get some critical feedback, also receive two thumbs up. One question by Anonymous. Are there any improvements in Podman testing? I got hit by several regressions in the last year. I already answered that, you know, we, we make sure that we always add regression tests and in fact, our CI is rejecting PRs from being merged without adding tests, but maybe you wanna, wanna iterate a little bit, bit on that. Yeah, it, it's, it's somewhat difficult. One of, the things, one of the things a lot of people got hit by regressions or, or problems is usually um, on different distributions. So most of the, the core development team obviously works in Fedora uh, world. So the Fedora is probably the most stable way to run uh, Podman, but we have a, obviously a huge user base on top of Debian and Ubuntu. And what, what I see a lot of problems happening is when we go to release um, the tooling that we build for on, on top of other distributions sometimes is, is buggy for a week or so uh, while we write, race through and fix those because we're not doing enough testing on other platforms. We actually test on top of Ubuntu and, and Fedora in our, in our core testing environment. Um, but you know, the package, the guys we have packaging tools are doing things on top of Kubrick project. And sometimes they miss, you know, they mishandle, you know, certain new features. So that's caused some issues. And our goal really is to get, we want to get out of the packaging business. So we're, you know, Podman is now available from Debian directly. It's uh, going to be available directly in Ubuntu. Uh, and, and then have people who are more expert in the different distributions to be able to package package it. Uh, but yeah, as far as bugs, you know, we're, we're racing ahead at, at breakneck speed. So sometimes we have regressions and we're trying, our testing is expanding hugely in, in Compose. I mean, and, and, but anytime you guys have a bug, report it to us if you can, get a fix for it and get us enhanced testing. You know, testing is key to this, to, to a project, you know, a huge project like Podman. It's, you know, it's, it's key.